All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody to our um, virtual luncheon here with uh, Scott Hodge, president of the Tax Foundation. To set this up, you know, I've been in think tanks, in and out of think tanks since the 90s, and the Tax Foundation has been one of my go to resources for taxation, for federal tax policy, for state tax policy, and for just doing really useful comparisons of data. And so I thought it'd be really nice to have someone from the Tax Foundation on um, right before tax day to talk about taxes and um, you know how the tax code actually works, who pays taxes, get into the details a little bit more than you would see in the media. And um, Scott Hodge, the president of the Tax Foundation was kind enough to join us for this chat. Scott's been president since 2000, if I had that right? That's correct. Yeah. So you're the 21st century Tax Foundation. Um, and the organization dates back to the 30s, so it's been around a very long time. So we really appreciate you coming on and talking to us about this stuff. Can you just really quickly give us a little bit of your background? How did you wind up at the Tax Foundation and why is this such an important issue? Uh, well, thank you very much for having me, Drew. I really appreciate it. And it's uh, great to be with you on Tax Day, even though this is kind of a painful day for a lot of people. Uh, I've been in the think tank world for uh, roughly 40, over 40 years. I got involved in the free market uh, movement in uh, 1981. And then in the early 80s, 1984, helped start the, the Heartland Institute, which is a think, think tank in Chicago. I wrote the original business plan for that. I then went to um, Washington and spent uh, 10 years at the Heritage Foundation, uh, two years at a group called Citizens for a Sound Economy, and then was tapped to run the Tax Foundation in 2000. And I'm now entering my 22nd year here. So I'm a think tank lifer. And uh, it's a, it's a, a wonderful uh, way of um, advancing your principles and doing something that you love for a what I think is a noble cause. And that's trying to change the world uh, to our principles of free markets and free people. Great, and it is a, it is a good cause. I'm, I'm a think tank slash newspaper lifer. I've gone back and forth between the two and back to the think tank world. And it's, it's a pretty great world. So I wanna start off with a really basic question for you because I think this is kind of the foundation of taxation in general. What is the purpose of taxation? Ah, a great question. Uh, really in simple terms, uh, taxes are simply a means for the government to raise revenues to pay for the basic functions of government. And we have a series of principles that we stand for here at the Tax Foundation. Uh, we believe taxes should be neutral, meaning they shouldn't be used to either punish some people or groups and reward others. Uh, taxes should be simple, meaning they should be simple to administer and simple for us to comply with. They should be transparent. We ought to know where and why we're paying taxes and what those taxes are going for. And they should be stable, meaning there should be a lot of fluctuations and changes in policy so that we can live our lives knowing and being able to predict uh, the tax policy in the future. Unfortunately, all those things are being uh, violated uh, oftentimes in tax policy where taxes are being used uh, to reward some behavior and punish other behavior. And taxes are anything but simple and they're anything but transparent. And oftentimes they change frequently so they're not stable. So our work is really cut out for us in trying to come to a, a tax system that uh, is friendly to everybody and uh, as, as least disruptive to the economy as possible. Well, your job is in large part to analyze and explain the tax code, which means you will never, ever, ever be out of work. There will always be something for you to do. You I want you to get uh, really quickly on that point you made. So you have this, this basic principle list. Um, a, I think it would be great if, have you, have you ever tried to get you know, some friendly representative or senator to introduce you know, a bill to put that into the, ta into the into law? You know, hey, look, here are our principles for taxation. <laughs> Any attempt that's to do a, that? Would, what, what would be the response? <laughs> That's a great idea. Uh, we should try that. There is a uh, uh, taxpayer bill of rights that was passed during uh, the 1990s, and uh, that became the introduction of an, a new office at the IRS called the Taxpayer Advocate, and that person is there to represent taxpayers and, and oversee them. But 
Um, as far as having basic principles, it would be a really good thing to interject that into the tax code because oftentimes it's just violated by both policymakers and the IRS. So there are two things I want you to just really quickly address. Um, first is the complexity. I, you hear a lot of people say, well, the tax code is complex because X. Um, what would be your go-to quick answer for to explain why it's so complex? It's simply being used uh, for too many things. And the poor IRS is, is suffering from this because uh, they are both a tax collector and a benefit provider. Mm -hmm. And thanks to congressional action over the past 30 years or more, uh, they've stuffed the tax code with all kinds of things uh, in an attempt to provide uh, social welfare benefits, healthcare benefits, um, put uh, solar panels on your roof, buy an electric car, put your kid in daycare, adopt a child, take care of grandma, uh, uh, buy a home, you name it, it's been stuffed into the tax code and the poor IRS is having to manage all of this and, and we're trying to comply with it all. And in fact, there was a warning this morning uh, where the general accounting office uh, has done an analysis of, of tax season and there's a lot of concerns that because of all the attempts to provide benefits through the uh, COVID crisis, through the tax system, that this year's uh, uh, filing uh, uh, season will be a complete mess. Mm -hmm. The IRS is still trying to uh, wade through last year's tax returns. They have millions that they're trying to, to um, uh, complete. And this year is probably going to be more of the same. We're simply asking this tax collection agency to do too much. And we're not going to have a simple tax code if we continue to add duties to it that it simply can't do. Sure. We're using the tax code basically to manipulate people's behavior, to encourage some behaviors, discourage others. And that creates a lot of complexity. And, and um, you know, one of the things that I thought was interesting, so it was a while back when we had this talk about adding and Biden was talking about it. Um, you know, a, a lot more IRS agents. So you can audit more people and raise more revenue. And my response to that, especially if you've, you know, ever had any questions in the last couple of years and needed somebody at the IRS, it's impossible to get through. It's impossible to get a hold of anybody. And it seems to me that you actually could put a lot more federal money into the IRS and hire a lot more staff, but not on the auditing side, just on the um, taxpayer helpline side. It seems like they've, uh, you know, lost a lot of agents in that, uh, or a lot of staff on that side. Is uh, do you have any info on that? Um, would you recommend they add more folks there just to help people understand it? I think there are multiple solutions to helping out the IRS. The the taxpayer advocate recently reported that the IRS is only answering about eleven percent of all phone calls to it, and it's getting worse and worse every year. We have to, you know, there's a lot of criticism that uh, Republicans in particular have cut the IRS budget and therefore it's had to lay people or it hasn't been able to add people and the, and the staff is shrinking. But we have to remember that we are doing a lot of the work of the IRS now because so hmm. many of us are filing, filing electronically. The IRS right now is hiring thousands of people to manually enter paper tax returns. Now, back in the old days, every tax return was manually recorded into their computer systems by an IRS person. Well, we no longer have to do that. We are essentially doing their work for them by filing electronically. On the other hand, um, if we had the IRS doing fewer and fewer functions, like managing healthcare, managing welfare, managing transportation programs, they would have a lot more people to get to uh, put over to the uh, audit side and the customer service side of things. So we are just simply asking it to do things it shouldn't be doing, and therefore it doesn't have the resource to do what a tax collection agency, a service-oriented tax collection agency, uh, should be doing. So thinking about the U.S. tax code and um, other countries. I'm, I'm curious, you guys do a lot of research on OECD countries and how our tax code compares. How does the US government raise revenue differently than other developed countries do? First and foremost, we rely more on income-based taxes than do other countries. Uh, we have, as 
everyone knows, uh, individual income taxes. We have payroll taxes, which are an income-based taxes, and we have corporate income taxes. Other countries have those things too, but they also have things called a value-added tax, which is a consumption-based tax that raises a good portion of the revenues they need, uh, largely to fund a lot of their social welfare programs. We only rely at sales taxes, mostly at the state level, uh, and very, very little at the federal level. We have some excise taxes on beer and wine and things like that, cigarettes and whatnot, but that's a very small portion of federal revenue. So we're over, almost overly, overly reliant on income-based taxes, which is a problem for the economy. Because the OECD did a famous study about 10 years ago or so, ranking sort of the, uh, the harm caused by different types of taxes. They found that the corporate income tax is the most harmful tax for economic growth because capital is the most mobile factor in the economy and the most sensitive to high tax rates. Personal income taxes were found to be second most harmful mm -hmm. to economic growth because, hey, we can stop working, we can stop saving, we can stop investing uh, based on the level of, of tax rates. On the other hand, the, the third most harmful or least harmful <laughs> would be these, these sales type taxes or consumption taxes. Property taxes are the least harmful because property is immobile. So mm -hmm. what they suggested was that countries start moving away from income-based taxes to consumption taxes uh, in order to uh, improve economic growth. So we could be a lot more economically vibrant if we reduced our income taxes and shifted to more of a consumption tax. That could be a carbon tax, it could be a value-added tax or something else, but we would um, certainly improve the economy if we could do that. I think there'd be a lot of fear that you would get both at high rates, right? It, sure. um, you know, is there any trick to making a switch like that, where you actually kind of try to guarantee that you're really going to lower those income tax rates first or at the same time. So you don't wind up with Connecticut problem of <laughs> having all the taxes. Yeah, obviously that's the big danger and, and what people fear the most. And uh, those of us who believe in fundamental tax reform always worry about that sort of bait and switch where you know we, we go along with it, but then we end up getting both at high rates and then we look like uh, some European country. I will say, however, one of the interesting aspects of our system versus theirs is that a new study just came out of a Paris-based uh, left-wing think tank called the uh, World Inequality Lab. And they compared the tax systems in the US and Europe, mostly on the income tax side, and found that the US tax system is much more progressive than European tax systems and much more redistributive. We, were, we tax the wealthy far more than do European systems. And we use the tax code to help the poor and middle class far more than do European systems. Uh, we re redistribute a lot through the income tax uh, system, largely through things like the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, and all of these other social welfare programs that are baked into the tax system. So a lot of people don't really realize, they think, well, we're not Sweden at least. Well, <laughs> no, we're not. Sweden actually has a better tax system than we do. <laughs> Some of their rates may be a little bit higher, but they're a flatter system, more neutral and less harmful to the economy than we are. And we just become overly reliant on income taxes. And the rich pay the great the lion's share of taxes here in the, in the United States. And um, you know, we can talk more about that, but I think a lot of people just simply don't realize how progressive the tax system is. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. If you have <clears throat> have um, off the top of your head <laughs> the ability to to elaborate on that, on that a little bit, because every time I hear Liz Warren and Bernie Sanders say that the rich don't pay their fair share and, and they're getting away with it and they're, they've rigged the tax code. When you look at the actual data on who pays the taxes, you can roll your eyes and go, do they even know what they're talking about? Well, it's pure demagoguery. And, and I testified before both of their committees last year. And uh, as I pointed out to Bernie Sanders, um, uh, fair share is a subjective term. But there are facts, and facts are objective, and the facts show that we have a very, very progressive tax system and one that's very redistributive. The, the top 1% of taxpayers in the United States pays 40% of all the income taxes. 
Now, to put that in context, that's a larger share of the income tax burden than is paid by the bottom 90% of people. So imagine we're going out to dinner with 10 people, one person paying more than all the other nine people. That gives you an indication of how progressive the system is. So that, that top 1% is paying a larger share of the tax burden than 120 million of their neighbors combined. The other thing is we have millions of people who are simply off the tax rolls who, or who pay nothing because of the generous credits and deductions that have been built into the code. In fact, an estimate was made for last year. Now it was an unusual year because of all the COVID relief, but they estimated that 61% of all American households pay no income taxes because of all of these relief programs that were built in. On a normal year, um, we're around a third of all taxpayers pay zero income taxes because of the credits and deductions. But that's increasing because we are making these things much more uh, generous. So as many as four out of 10 in any given year will pay zero income taxes. And many of those people actually get a check back on April 15th because of the refundable nature of these credits. So even if you don't owe anything, you can still get these refundable tax credits. So in many respects, some people look at April 15th as payday and not tax day. Mm. <clears throat> I, I really like to be able to say one day, as I pointed out to Bernie Sanders, I think that would be, that's something <laughs> not a lot of people can say, it's pretty great. Um, well, Bernie will often point to Scandinavian countries. Uh, yeah. As, as being better, but one of the things your organization, I think, has pointed out is that we tax the wealthy at super high rates, and we don't tax the middle class the way they do. Can, can you touch on that a little bit? I mean, to get that level of social services, um, they, they rely on taxing the middle class at much higher rates than we do. That's correct. In fact, uh, in some cases, like Sweden, for instance, their top rate kicks in at a much lower income level than ours does. It's, and so actually, we consider that a little bit better so you don't have the penalties that are built mm -hmm. in. But on the other hand, uh, their reliance on value-added taxes uh, really is what um, uh, adds to the overall tax burden within Europe. And that's what pays for a lot of their social welfare programs. The typical a uh, tax rate for a value added tax in Europe is at least 20%. So that's, you know, when you buy anything uh, at the at the store, you got to factor in the fact that that at least 20% of that cost is the value added tax. Uh, and oftentimes it's hidden from view because it is baked into the price of the good rather than our sales tax, which is added to it. So it's a little more transparent. But over there, their value added tax is baked in. And I remember visiting um, a year, couple of years ago and having a um, senior tax official say that the value added tax is the perfect tax for funding big government because it can be, it's essentially built into the price of good, of mm -hmm. good and you can dial up the rate anytime you need more revenue and people don't realize it. Pretty tricky. Yeah, well, it, I think the gas tax would be something similar here, right? Because it's not added on after it's included in the price and you have no idea how much of the price of a gallon of gas is the gas tax versus right. anything else. So if it's nudged up a little bit, yeah, price goes up a little bit, you have no idea. That's, a, yeah, and, and that, that defies one of our principles of transparency. Right. You know, be able to see the tax, know where it's going for. And, and if you can't do that, then you know government's pulling one over on you. <laughs> I don't know if you ever watched the series um, Sleepy Hollow that was on a few years ago. Uh, the premise was pretty quirky, but Ichabod Crane, a Revolutionary War soldier, woke up and he's in modern times. And there's this early episode where he just looks at the the bill from a um, Dunkin' Donuts and gets outraged at the tax. He couldn't. He can't believe it. <laughs> and I, I, I think that's something that. You know, we, because of the income tax, because of the way um, sales taxes work, we grew up in this sort of ecosystem where they're all around us. And I don't, I think most Americans kind of don't realize how heavily taxed we are historically in our own country. Like if you were to take somebody out of the early 20th century, even 
um, and show them a tax bill today, they would be astonished and outraged. And I, I, I think the founders would be grabbing their muskets <laughs> at looking at our tax rates right now. Um, one of the questions we have is, um, so the top 1% pay 40% of income taxes. What percentage of the income for the federal government does that 1% produce? Yeah, that's the natural uh, follow-up question. Anytime I use that statistic of how much they actually pay, people say, well, they must earn all the income. <laughs> well, it turns out they earn 20% of the nation's income. Hmm. So let's imagine we had a tax system that was proportional to how much we contribute to the economy. Well, they would be paying uh, about 20% of all income taxes rather than 40%. So you can look at it saying that, oh, they're actually paying twice what they're actually contributing to the economy. Overall, uh, when we look at the entire tax system, that top 1% pays 25% of all federal taxes, no matter what you know, income, corporate taxes, payroll taxes, and everything else. So they do bear a very, very substantial share of the income tax system. And yes, they earn quite a bit of money, but let's talk about who the rich are, because that's often forgotten here. As we, and then the Bernie Sanders of the world like to, um, like to uh, uh, treat the rich as they're sort of you know, monolithic, you know, this one thing called the rich. Hmm. The rich are people, but more often than not these days, the rich are actually business owners who pay their business taxes through the personal income tax system rather than the corporate system. They're S corporations and LLCs and sole proprietorships. And we've seen an explosion of those kinds of business forms over the last 30 years, or really since 1986 tax reforms. And so as a consequence, more and more of those types of businesses are filing their taxes on the individual tax return uh, than on corporate returns. And they're giving the impression of this rising inequality when what actually we're seeing is just more and more business income taxed on the individual return rather than the old fashioned corporate return. In fact, there's more business income taxed on individual tax returns today than on corporate returns. And so we have seen this shift over the years away from corporations and into these privately owned businesses. And as a consequence, as it, it's created this in perception in my mind of rising inequality, when it's really a change in the demographics of taxpayers. And thinking of corporate income taxes, uh, another Biden administration proposal is, is the global minimum tax. So oh, yeah. Ireland, um, which if you know anything at all about the history of the UK and, and the British Isles. I mean, Ireland was, um, you know, occupied, poverty stricken, um, not the place you would, you would want to go start a business for most of history. And, um, you know, they, they had tax reform, they had some business reforms, and Ireland became a booming, you know, first world economy, one of the richest in Europe. And, you know, their top corporate tax rate is 12 and a half percent. Biden wants a global minimum tax of 15%. So he wants to eliminate the ability to seek out lower corporate, uh, a country with lower corporate tax rates. I, I refer to it as, as Biden's Berlin Wall. He wants to build a wall to keep us from escaping high taxes. Um, you've probably followed this a little bit. What's the progress on that? And what would be the result um, for U.S. companies and, and Americans if that were actually to, to take effect? Well, the Biden administration wants to raise uh, the U.S. corporate tax rate. It's currently 21%. They want to raise it to at least 28%. They also want to do some other changes to the way that larger global businesses are taxed to raise a considerable amount of revenues from them. Overall, in the latest budget, they're proposing $1.6 trillion worth of uh, taxes um, uh, on corporations. Uh, and what my opinion is that the administration's support of this global minimum tax is essentially to create an international tax cartel hmm. to actually protect the U.S. from its declining competitiveness. Hmm. Because they know that if they raise the corporate tax rate, that we will be less competitive globally. So the only way that they can, they can justify this is to get other countries 
to raise their corporate taxes in order to protect the flight of capital out of the United States. So this is nothing more than, than trying to create a global tax cartel and in the process undermine the sovereignty of countries like Ireland with that 12.5% corporate tax rate. Estonia, which has a wonderful uh, cash flow tax for corporations, which is a, a really excellent, very competitive system. And other countries, whether it's Switzerland or, or elsewhere, that use low tax policy in order to be competitive because they don't have large populations, they don't have natural resources and so forth. That's the way that they can become competitive. But no, the big countries like France and Germany and the United States want to step in and create this global tax cartel to essentially stomp on their sovereignty and prevent them from using tax competition to be competitive. What's the global effect of this? We really worry about the economic consequences of this in multiple ways. Yeah, you know, global minimum tax could do a lot of things like throwing sand in the gears of foreign domestic investment, of cross-border capital flows, of, um, of, of simply the ability of companies um, uh, to determine where they would like to do business uh, based on tax and other issues. So there, the, the, the challenge for, I think, those of us who are pushing for pro-growth reform is to try to, to, to nip this in the bud and to stop this movement toward a global minimum tax, keep tax competition alive, and help countries reform their systems so that they can see tax reform uh, in their own best interests. I really do worry that if we push this global minimum tax, the global economy will begin to slow down because the cost of capital and the cost of doing business globally will rise. And that simply means less investment, less jobs, and less economic growth. And we see that in a microcosm, uh, not that the United States is, a, is, is small, but when you look at the entire United States and the way states compete. So there's a reason why New Hampshire um, typically has the most booming economy in New England, um, yeah. you know, among the highest growth in the country. And there's a reason why Texas, Florida, Tennessee, for example, um, in the last decade or so have been growing population wise and their economies have been growing at much higher rates than New York, Illinois, and California. In your research, do states really compete on tax rates? Does that actually work? It does, and we've, we're seeing a lot of it these days. In fact, my team has been, uh, been recording all of the tax movements over the last two years or so. And really in the last 18 months, uh, we've seen more than a dozen states cut either their, their personal or corporate income tax rates. And in some cases, quite considerably, Iowa ju just passed a, a significant tax reform bill that will slash their taxes uh, from you know, nearly double digits all the way down to about 4%, uh, leaving it very, very competitive. Other states are moving to actually eliminate things like their corporate income tax. Mm -hmm. So tax competition is alive and well. And as you can see there in your home state, Having a, uh, not having a sales tax has been a great boon uh, to the New Hampshire economy. Um, I was looking, um, doing a little Google search the other day and found that the nearest Best Buy to uh, the, in uh, Massachusetts to the New Hampshire border is 25 miles away from Nashua. <laughs> and that tells you a lot. When my, my wife was a grad student in Boston, she drove to New Hampshire to buy it, her first laptop computer mm. <laughs> and snuck it over the border without paying the use tax. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is the kind of tax competition we see all the time. And we are seeing a migration of people away from these high tax states like New York and New Jersey and Chicago and in and, and California to low tax, tax states like you know, Texas and, and um, Tennessee and Florida. Hedge funds are pulling up stakes from New, uh, Manhattan and going to Florida. Why would you pay a 13% income tax in Manhattan if you can, you can, you can do work tax-free uh, living remotely and working remotely in Florida? Tax competition's alive and well, and we're doing everything possible <laughs> to encourage it. <laughs> well, um, I think we're gonna wrap up there. This was a great chat, so thank you so much for your time. I don't see any other questions in the chat function here. So um, 
Scott Hodge, president of the Tax Foundation. Thank you so much. This was a, a really great introduction to the way you guys view taxes and how tax competition and tax rates actually work. So um, we're going to spread this around and educate a bunch of people. Thank you very much, Drew. And, and I encourage everybody to come to our website at taxfoundation.org. We've got a wealth of information on every level of tax, on state taxes, federal taxes, and now even global taxes. And we have a wonderful new page called Tax EDU. That's our, hmm. our tax literacy effort, where we're trying to give people information to make them a lot smarter about taxes and the economics of taxes so that they don't be they, they don't be, get bamboozled by people like Bernie Sanders. The smarter <laughs> you are on taxes. Uh, the more you can protect yourself from the demagogues out there. That's exactly right. That's why we had you on, to give people some ammunition to fight back against uh, all the misinformation out there. And I can personally recommend Tax Foundation. They do absolutely fantastic work. It's taxfoundation.org. I would encourage everybody to go there and um, bookmark it and use their stuff on a regular basis because they do a bunch of great work. So thank you so much, Scott. And we'll hope to do this again sometime. My pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. See you later.